Uh, apologies for the delay uh, for this this latest episode. I've been a little under the weather, however, feeling a bit better. Um, my voice is still a little croaky, so bear with me. Um, this week's episode, we're going to cover the aerodynamic concept of the car. Uh, also, I'm going to be answering some of your comments and suggestions around the other engines I should have picked from the last episode. I've enjoyed listening, reading all your comments and then going and, and looking through the other engines that I may have already considered or not considered at all. Um, and finally, I have some footage of the first startup of my race engine over in New Zealand. Uh, they've been uh, running that in on the dyno and doing some work in an NA format and I have a little video for you all to, to watch it do its one of its first runs. So that's all to follow. Um, if you're enjoying the videos, I would appreciate it if you liked them and also subscribe so you can keep up to date. Okay, so let's get into it. Let's go and look over the aerodynamic concept of the car. Um, so when I say concept, what I mean is essentially how am I going to go and make downforce out of the car um, and so with Pikes Peak and also this time attack uh, um, competition format there are actually very few rules around it so we have you know opportunity to do whatever we want which sounds fantastic but also now we have to go and select something that will will do what we want out of it so I wanted to define the problem first of all and really there are two problems there's first of all Pikes Peak and then the second problem is going and setting lap records. Okay, so for Pike's Peak, what we have to consider first and foremost is the very thin air. Air density ranges from around 75% to 60% of that of sea level. And that really changes the, uh, the mix of aerodynamic characteristics that creates a fast race car. Um, for instance, when I was doing my... Um, lap sim analysis in canopy back in the day um, it would spit out a number called the isochronal ratio and that basically dictates how much downforce you have to add for a given amount of drag a bit like an efficiency number for the car to go faster so if you imagine a track like silverstone or somewhere like that which is very high speed you'd be needing to adding you know downforce on at five times the amount of drag for the car to go any faster um, whereas if you consider a circuit like Monaco, maybe that is two times. So you have to add twice the amount of downforce to drag to go and make the car go faster. Um, five to one is quite a hard thing to go and achieve. Um, that's a very efficient downforce generating device. Something like two to one Monaco, well, that's a lot easier to go and do. You can just kind of bolt on a plate at an angle. You might get that, uh, that efficiency out of that. Um, but then for Pike's Peak, what I found was it gave an isochronal ratio of 0.5. So that means if it makes half the amount of downforce to drag, that would still make the car about the same speed up the mountain. So anything better than that would be a performance increase. I'm a little dubious around that number, but still it gets to show you that the downforce is king on the mountain. And that's what we've really got to consider with that car concept. Um, also consider, and this is part of that reason, average speed up there for the fastest you know, for the for the record is nine only ninety five mile an hour. That's very fast for that road, but uh, an overall motor racing uh, that's quite a slow average speed. Uh, and you can normalize that number around the forces. So it's like okay, ninety five mile an hour. What's that average speed equivalent on a racetrack at sea level? Well, that's down at around seventy eight mile an hour um, to go and make a similar force there. So so now we're considering a car that's going to be you know averaging seventy eight mile an hour. That really shows you how much downforce you want to wind on to the car. Um, the next thing is the road is incredibly bumpy. Um, it's pretty smooth at the bottom, but there's still significant bumps. And as you get up to near the top, the, the road really starts to break up. And the last mile or so is really, really bad. Um, and the car is, you know, I'm seeing over 4G of bumps going into the car through the suspension without grounding out. So it's a really rough ride up at the top. Um, so with that, um, the suspension has to go and take those bumps um, and the suspension travel I run on the car it's actually a little over two inches um, 
and I'm running in ride heights around you know 60 to 80 millimeters statically and then dynamically we're talking more in the region of 30 to 40 uh, to 30 to 40 millimeters so when I say dynamic that's with some load on the car you know at this average speed or a little more this is where the car is really performing with that aerodynamic platform at that height um, so with all those bumps as well we've got to consider the suspension um, needs to be a little softer than we see on a racetrack uh, and that means the car has got to go and work over those range of ride heights so you know once it's getting going around the 60 mil all the way down to the 20 millimeters fully you know the full bump travel maybe even a little lower as it grounds out the car's got to work over that very broad range of ride heights which is also hard to do as well so that's actually quite a unique uh, aerodynamic platform setup that you need that is very different to you know a road racing circuit where you know with a car with this much downforce you consider LMP cars or you're considering F1 is running within a much tighter range maybe 10 millimeters of, of ride height change with all that so quite a different um, uh, challenge um, and then when we look at about the, the just the general time attack black, black records that's a lot more conventional um, the air is a lot thicker, also you're seeing far higher speeds. Um, both the average speed is increased and then the top speed is a lot higher as well. You know, on Pikes Peak there are very few straights. Most of them are corners running onto a short straight, so there's, there's not much time to, to gather speed. Whereas on a, on a race course those straights are much, much longer. Um, and that means... Uh, First of all, drag is a lot, lot more important. We've got to consider it, but we still want the downforce. So that lift over drag number is much more important. Um, we're going to be running the car a lot lower because the tracks are smoother and we'll be able to run a much stiffer spring. So that change in ride height will be a lot less. So we can you know, make the car work much better around a particular sweet spot. Um, and the other thing we have to consider you know with these very high speeds and the thicker air is just the overall force on the tires and on the suspension is going to be really really high if we were to take the downforce required for pikes peak and run it on uh you know a racetrack if we you know let's say we've got infinite power or you know the car's really slippery we, we get into the point where we're just putting too much load through the car um, so that's also something to consider and actually a challenge uh, the, 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 that we have with, with cars with this much downforce. So knowing that, it's, it's actually quite clear that we really need two aero packages or aero, let's say, configurations on the car, which is a high downforce and then also a low downforce version of it. So designing this car, we need to be able to put some adjustability into it. Um, and we can do that both statically, adjusting wing angles or removing or adding parts. Also, we could maybe consider that dynamically in an active aero sense. Um, so because there are very few rules, we have this opportunity at looking at other aero technologies, other, you know, which can be active. Um, they can be, you know, I'm going to touch on the active types. And we're also looking at the connecting things to the unsprung mass as well. Um, so the big one that a lot of people have mentioned and has you know, I've put a lot of consideration into is is a fan car, essentially. Um, we saw that uh, a long, long time ago um, with a Can-Am car. Um, and then more recently, we've seen it with the McMurtry. Um, fantastic car. The fan is, is very clear in that it's working really well and is a huge part of that car's performance. Uh, it set the the overall record at Goodwood Festival of Speed, so we, um, we've really got to pay attention to it. And and you go and look at how that car moves and how different that is to anything else, you know, on the racetrack. That's it's an outstanding technology. Um, however, going and using that on the mountain is going to be a little bit different. Um, first of all, consider the air pressure. So it's you know, let's say right at the top is sixty percent you know, 60% of the air pressure up there than you have at sea level. So that means there's only 60% of the air that can go and sit on the car. And the next thing to consider that, you know, that system is essentially quite a high pressure ratio, smaller area. Um, from what I've read online it is that it's, you know, that the skirt, the sealed skirt is about the footprint of the tub. 
and so the so the the fan itself is pulling out a lot of air and creating like quite a big vacuum there um, and so that's you know that that goes back into essentially compressor dynamics and you know any compressor is also working at that you know only 60 percent of the efficiency that it does at sea level so those two multiply together so those two by themselves means that you're you're only going to really be making 36 percent of the downforce you know approximately to what you would at sea level um so you consider the mcmurtry system and it says it can do 2000 kilos of downforce absolutely believe that um I have spoken to the, some of the engineers actually. I had a had a tour of um, the facility, uh, which I was very grateful for, and got to learn a little more about the car. Um, and uh, what they were saying was, typically they don't run it at that peak number; they run it a little bit lower, so that in case the skirt gets a leakage, um, you've got some capacity in the system to quickly draw that air back out and maintain the seal back up to that that set downforce level. And that's going to be a big issue on the mountain where the road's definitely not perfect and the tarmac's actually quite porous, which makes a big difference because essentially that's where the leakage is coming from. If you have a good seal, there's still air being able to be drawn through the tarmac. Um, so you're going to run that system at not at 100%. So let's assume 75% in this case, there's a little bit of headroom. Um, and you go and do the math on all that. 2,000 kilos now turns into like five, you know, around 500 kilos of downforce. Um, and knowing what I know about the passive systems I've run, you're probably going to overtake that amount of downforce on the mountain at around 90 mile an hour. Uh, below that, still a still a clear advantage um, that you're going to have being able to generate those cornering force, you know, those really high cornering forces at that lower speed. But everything above that, the passive system is going to outperform it. You, you've got to also consider that system is two compressors. Um, and also a high voltage electrical system, so a battery, uh, motors, and all that. That's that's probably you know you're talking maybe thirty to fifty kilos of, of additional weight on the car. Um, McMurtry, because that's a Bev that can use the um, the battery pack to go and run it. But for my car, being internal combustion, that's a whole new system to go and run it. And whether I do that with electric motors, which I think is the best thing, because you get the precise control, or an internal combustion. Um, it, you you know you need a whole separate system to go and do that so um, other things I considered was you know the 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 unpredictable nature of the road the amount of bumps um, the amount of dust all this these complications on that I I wouldn't count on having a successful attempt at going and doing that I know how clever the guys are at McMurtry and I definitely couldn't get anywhere near that by myself um, so I kind of left that one and, and, and I hope McMurtry come to the mountain and see how that system does and I'm sure with a bit of refinement they could get it they could get it working really well and that's got a huge potential to go and set the record but that's not a that's not a path a journey I think I can go and achieve doing it myself so I'm going to stick to a more conventional aerodynamic package and really focus on getting the fundamentals of the car uh, strong and good um, so yeah in conclusion really it's just too much risk for the potential reward. I'm, um, I don't think I can go and pull that one off. So the next one is unsprung aero. Um, now this this idea is basically rather than having the wings attached to the sprung sprung part of the car and all the springs having to react that force and you then force you to have stiff suspension, you actually attach the aerodynamic parts of the car directly into essentially the wheel uprights. Um, the Lotus did this, I'm going to get the type number wrong, um, it was around 80s, 82 maybe. Um, they, they created this whole separate floor um, around the car, it's actually quite square and boxy with skirts that, that had these, you know, to meet the rules, had very soft springs that just gets, you know, sucked down to the ground at about 20 mile an hour and then the body's ground out on the hubs and it's doing that. I did, as a kid, go to Lotus factory, saw that car and got to lean on the body and those springs are very soft, you know, literally it would take a couple pounds of force and they would compress and the body is set on the ground at that point. Um, to go and achieve that concept, it's a full, you know, vehicle architecture dedicated to going and doing that again. Um, and there isn't a lot of literature around um, going and doing that. 
essentially you're putting all the force um, into the tire the tire is becomes the spring and the damper and it can be tricky to go and control that so looking at the mountain again where it's quite bumpy and rough you need good suspension i don't know if that's a headache i want to go and um, go and challenge with that full vehicle concept because if that doesn't work then i'm a little screwed however you can also do more along the lines of what we see in formula one with the uh, brake brake ducts which are barely brake ducts but aerodynamic devices which both drive the floor themselves and and also cool the brakes but we could look at putting small aerodynamic devices on the insides or maybe even outsides of the wheels and, and having a portion of that force through those items um, and it doesn't affect truly the full architecture of the car so that is actually very interesting and something that you know, I would, wouldn't call it a fundamental of how the car would work, but some extra performance we could add to the car by adding the forces to those parts, components of the car. So promising, I think we'll, I'll be developing that as the car, you know, gets built and I first run it and then I'm adding more and more performance to it. That's a, an area that I'll go to, to go and in, in, improve the performance. The next one is DRS, drag reduction system. We see that in Formula One and other series now. Um, and that's essentially done by the rear wing flap opening up, um, really reducing the downforce on the rear wing uh, and correspondingly reducing the drag. Um, for Pike's Peak, uh, DRS in itself isn't that beneficial. You're getting a couple mile an hour on a couple of the straights. Time-wise, it's maybe going to get you a second or two. And if you go and look at the weight of the system, that probably, you know, outweighs the performance of the of the DRS system. So that in itself is not super helpful. But then if we consider this from a load limiting standpoint, you know, we could put as many wings as possible on the car and even at Pike's Peak, we could overwhelm the suspension and tire. If we could go and, you know, relieve some of that force at the higher speeds. And remember downforce is uh, created at the square of the speeds, which means if you, if you double your speed, you'll get four times the forces. That's an important thing to remember. At those higher speeds, it's kind of important to be able to wind off the aerodynamics. So. That has some potential to it. Biggest problem is you get huge balance shift. You see this in Formula One. Once you open that rear wing, you lose a lot of rear end downforce, but the front is still making most of its downforce. So that balance has to be managed. Um, and you can do it in one of two ways. Uh, one of the ways is you know the rear wing is so combined with the whole floor of the car and the rear wing essentially is like a pump pulling more air under the car and that makes a lot more downforce. If you get the, the contour of the floor correct, you could potentially open and close a rear wing flap without it having too much of a balance change. Um, I like the idea of that, uh, something I'm pursuing at the moment to try and get that dialed in. And the other thing we can do is also have another essentially DRS system on the front of the car. The Porsche 911 GT3 RS does this on the row car um, where you have active rear rear wings and front wings and then you can you know do that as a drs discrete push a button everything opens up or you can do it as a full active system which is able to you know uh, modulate itself depending on your speeds corners attitudes all that good stuff so uh in conclusion those kinds of systems look very very promising if they're also hard to go and achieve um, and also there's a huge safety aspect for Pikes Peak in particular. If they go wrong, that could be catastrophic. So that is something that is an opportunity and I am exploring those systems. So that will be some, some elements of unsprung aero and also DRS active aero flaps as well. Um, and I think a lot of that has a lot more potential on the lap records than it does on Pikes Peak. Um, but these systems have to be in addition to the fundamental performance of the car. Um, and that's really what I'm working towards is that great foundation baseline of a car that makes really good downforce at a lot of ride heights. Um, and then from there, we just keep building on that. That's essentially the philosophy of it. So in conclusion, really, you're going to see quite a conventional aerodynamic package. Um, the layout of the car is going to be a little different. It's really leaning on uh, a heavily tunneled floor, um, a lot of underbody aerodynamics rather than the wings at either end. Um, with the Wolf, we started off with big 
wings front and rear and that had you know you can really feel the downforce where it's coming from if it's coming from the ends of the car so it becomes very pitch sensitive or if it comes from the center of the car where it really feels locked in in the middle so really leaning on a, a very aggressive floor to make the majority of the downforce and then we have the front wing you know per the 1980s ground effects cars which is more of a trimming device than it is a um a, a downforce generator itself and then the rear wing, which is there to bring, you know, rear balance to the car and also really work that floor hard. That rear wing creates a pressure, a low pressure zone underneath it. And if you can tie that into the floor as well, that, that increases that low pressure zone behind the car and really drives the floor harder. So that's essentially the aerodynamic philosophy of the car is to make, have a very aggressive floor and go and work that as hard as possible and make that work over a very broad amount of ride heights. So yeah, that's it. So now I'm going to touch on some of the questions. Um, although this week is a little different to questions, but suggestions of engines that I maybe should have considered for the car. I'm just going to run through um, if I consider them or not and, and why they would or wouldn't be good for the car. Um, the big one was rotors, uh, rotary engines. Um, I actually owned and raced a, a rotary car uh, a few years ago. It was the, the Pro Mazda, which had the Renesis engine in it. So I am familiar with that. I have catastrophically blown up one of those engines. I had a seizure about 120 mile an hour as a rotor exploded and became stuck, um, which is rare, but, but still. Um, one of the things uh, I learned when running that car was how thermally inefficient they are. So it's, it's not quite a two-stroke engine, uh, but it's, I forget, some people describe it as a three-stroke, mm, who knows. But the, um, the point is the thermal efficiency of it is not great, and it means it puts a lot of heat into both the cooling and the oiling system. And that becomes an even bigger issue the you know, more power you make, and then you go and take that to Pike's Peak, um, where you're making, you know, where you've got that lack of air density, you're you're making life really hard for yourself and, and go and look at Rob Darm and his his endeavors at the mountain you see how tricky it is I had a conversation with him before before the race run his race day run saying how can I stop this car overheating and and uh, still go as fast as possible and explain to him the lift and coast in that case so um, that's an issue also how light is it it is a light engine when you compare it to you know conventional v8s but it's still not the lightest so something like the the three rotor that long block is it's around 120 kilos compared to the prototipo is you know almost 70 so um that is a 50 kilo difference which is significant there so you, you've got a you've got an engine um that is uh you know, a good bit heavier, uh, you know, needs a lot more essentially cool, coolers, so space in the car and also bigger intakes for those coolers to go and cool the car, which hurts the aerodynamics. It's just not as good as, as, um, as we know what we're doing with this little V8. Um, and you would have seen that, I mean, you know, rotaries would have done a lot more in motorsport, I think, if they were truly the best thing to go and do. Um, I still love them. That two rotor I raced was an absolutely beautiful, smooth engine and had a really flat torque curve. The next engine um, that was suggested, and I hadn't really thought of this one, but I didn't know of it, and then went back and looked through it, was the Elmer Thor engine. That, that's that been used in, I think, the quickest time attack car in the world at the moment, which is, if I remember, the Porsche 968. Um, and that has a lot of promise to it. It's a three liter engine. Um, four cylinder though, all billet can make insane like two, three thousand horsepower. Jesus, that's a lot of go. Um, and it's pretty light, 106 kilo for the for the long block. So honestly, that would have been a pretty good shout. And I think if I was looking at a slightly, you know, more stoutly built car um, with a little more weight, that's probably a really sound engine choice to go and use. You could combine that maybe with Sadev's SLR 90 gearbox rather than the 82 I'm using. And, um, and I think that could serve you really well. It's got good displacement, um, which is important on the mountain also. So I think I think that could be a, a pretty neat engine. Uh, it is pretty expensive, but still is just about in the realms of, of, of obtainable, I would say. Um, talking of far more obtainable and 
you know, also been able to make a lot of power. Uh, I love these engines. It's the you know the LS GMLS small block engine. Um, it's a fantastic package. I've owned several Corvettes um, and know how how capable that motor is. But when we're looking at for this application, it's still physically, although it's very small dimensionally, and it's also very lightweight for the you know conventional V8. It's still big and heavy on the whole scheme of things. It's easily, you know, it's probably approaching three times the weight, at least double the weight of of what we're talking with with this little bike engine thing. And it makes too much torque. So again, that's a, an all new gearbox. The car then gets is easily another hundred kilos or so more than where I am right now. So everything has to get bigger and stronger and it didn't keep me in this window I wanted to stay in. Um, but you know, dollar per horsepower is pretty hard to touch that thing. Um, and they also sound great. So yeah, one day I'll build one of those. But for this, I wanted to keep it really small and lightweight and, and, and racy. Um, the next one was the K48 by Neutron Engines. I've enjoyed watching the social media content of this engine being designed and as it goes into you know being made. Um, because I started off with the K20s, so, you know, doubling it up was really, really interesting. Um, but I think you know that engine itself is is going to be a good bit heavier than what even what I got with the K20, and that also has that torque headache as well. You know, that's going to require that big gearbox. So you're probably talking something similar to the LS in terms of you know gearbox requirements. Maybe a little. It's probably going to be a little heavier because the LS is a more simple setup. And that's you know also a custom bespoke engine, and you know we're still waiting to see that going being made and used, which I really hope we do get to see that. So um, again, I would love to make a car with that engine in it one day, but for this project and for right now, it wasn't the right choice. And the last one, which I think was again another really good suggestion, similar to the Elmer Thor, is a Billet K24. Um, those engines, uh, you know, have proven to be a lot more stout. Um, with that billet block, it, it does get a little heavier, but I, I believe those blocks are getting a bit more optimized now um, in terms of weight. So, you know, it's probably around the Elmethor mass, um, and with, there is a lot more, you know, conventional heads and all that good stuff that could be used on it. So, you know, that would be an interim step from, um, you know, that Elmethor engine. However, it's the same headache of torque. People always ask me, why didn't I go K24 from K20? Well, you know, the K20 were already overloading the gearbox with torque. A K24 would just be even worse, but then we couldn't, you know, we couldn't go and um, rev that thing as hard as the K20. Um, so we end would end up making less power. So um, consider that one as well, but wanted to do something a little bit different, a little more special. Um, I wanted to, you know, have something screaming at 13,000 RPM on the mountain. So. All really good suggestions, really good choices, and I think every single one of those engines you could put into the back of the race car and it would be phenomenal. Uh, and we see that by people. Uh, I love the variety um, that we see at Pikes Peak with all these different engines because you know we've seen rotaries up there, we've seen the small blocks, we've seen you know a couple of different K series up there. Um, so yeah all these really good choices but uh, I've, I've gone with this prototipo engine and as you'll see in this video now it's started to run and it's sounding fantastic remember only 10,000 rpm so far so it's got a little more to go and then we're going to add a turbo to it so yeah exciting and enjoy thank you and see you in the next one mm -hmm.